Hi, this is Jim Janesey, and this is Chapter 20 of the Story of Art. In this chapter, we're going to take a quick look at Holland in the 17th century. Gombrich calls this the mirror of nature. We're actually talking about this part of Europe. Well north of the Alps, northern Europe became, by and large, Protestant. Here we have a town hall that, although it does have some embellishment here with this sort of artwork, it's a rather plain structure, Greek columns here, pilasters, which was dominated by city governments and a rather straight-laced sort of a citizenry. The taste was rather plain, and the structure reflects this. There's nothing very gaudy about this, as there might have been if this were typical Baroque architecture. We're going to take a look at a lot of different genres of art that developed in Protestant Europe after the Reformation. This is one example, which is a group portrait. So we have many, many faces here. This is an organization that wanted to commemorate itself for posterity, all of its members, kind of an honorary military sort of a guild that was in charge of protecting the city. It was kind of an inexpensive way to get a whole group of portraits done. This was a time when artists were really groping for ways to exercise their talents that didn't involve religion. Here we have Franz Halls, the same artist who did that earlier group portrait. A very unique ability here to capture more or less the character of this person. You can see from the expression on the man's face that he seems to be a happy person. It's the kind of a smile that might have only been there for a moment. He couldn't possibly have held that pose for as long as it took to create this portrait. So the artist really had a knack here for picturing and remembering something of the character of a person before he committed it to oil on the canvas. We started talking about different genres of art. This is a seascape. This particular artist developed a real following for doing these, and once he was more or less typecast in that role, people expected that he would draw these kinds of seascapes. He tended to draw them very accurately, and nautical historians still refer to his artwork for references on how the ships actually look. In a similar way, landscapes were developed by artists in this period, and the Dutch in particular developed a way to add real drama to a painting by enhancing the sky and showing a stormy sky here as a very dramatic effect, even though the landscape itself is rather plain. Here we have Rembrandt, a self-portrait. He did a lot of self-portraits. He's a very famous artist. His technique for painting was quite unique and quite extraordinary. We know a lot about him because he left so many self-portraits throughout his entire life that we can more or less see his whole life and face develop as he ages. Here's a portrait by Rembrandt. A couple of very noteworthy things here. Rembrandt established the whole idea that the painting was done when the artist said it was done, and not when perhaps the person being painted said it was done. And we notice here something very interesting. Take a look at this decoration on this man's coat and how it's really just lines of paint done this way, one brush stroke at a time, which was sufficient to convey that sort of an appearance in the mind of the artist. Also, this hand is unfinished, but it doesn't really detract because we're drawn to the man's face. And in fact, this rather loose and casual form of brushwork down here really is a precursor to the type of brushwork and the type of hints at things that later predominated in the Impressionist age more than 200 years after this painting was painted. Here's a sketch by Rembrandt where he can conjure up so much human emotion simply by the way he poses figures and the expression on this man's face. Obviously what's going on here is this man has loaned this man money. This man can't pay it back. He's reaching into the bottom of his pocket and we can readily imagine he doesn't have the money to pay back. And here's the bookkeeper, the accountant, the Bob Cratchit of this man who's keeping track of the books. A lot of emotion conjured up with just a few ink lines on paper. Another painting by Rembrandt where he's showing an interesting scene in an interesting way, the reconciliation of David and Absalom, a biblical scene. At the time this was painted, because biblical scenes were set in what was then called the Orient, which was really uh, Asia and the Middle East, possibly Rembrandt had seen Turks dressed up this way, so he seemed to think that perhaps that's the way these biblical characters should be represented. If you take a look at this sword, it's really uncanny how it almost appears to come right out of the canvas and the detailing on it and the way the metal shines. The emotion here, however, is really what the center of the painting is. The emotion of 
this man forgiving his son and reconciling the two. And here we have an etching. Etchings are like engravings, but of course the lines are created as lines in wax and then acid eats the lines into the plate. What Rembrandt has done here, it's a much softer sort of a an effect with the background here with these very fine lines. It's softer than you would get with engraving. Here we have Jesus teaching the very thoughtful pose of so many of these individuals. He's capturing, without even saying it in words, the idea that this man is saying things that are having a bearing on these men. There may be somebody here who has a different expression on his face, one where he's not thinking so much as objecting. Very interesting the way Rembrandt has been able to capture all of this, and in a composition that seems rather casual, seems to frame things in such a way that it's very well balanced. It's very pleasing to the eye. Another genre of art which began as picturing scenes of peasant life has now turned into just picturing scenes of ordinary life. These people are not necessarily peasants, but here we see a scene of a christening feast where apparently something has gotten a little messy here in this lower right, you know, some food spilled on the floor and something down here, and people just generally enjoying themselves after the christening of this little baby. So it's just like a snapshot would be today. It's just life in action and nothing very profound, nothing very moralistic or very special. It's a happy time for this family. Another genre of art is pure landscapes. Jakob von Ruisdale, very famous for the kind of detail. If we could take a look at a close-up of this, you would see that he's actually painted in individual leaves. A somewhat dramatic sky here. Landscapes became yet another genre that artists would focus on as a replacement for the kinds of church art that were no longer needed by churches in Protestant areas. And finally we come to pure still lifes. Here is where an artist has thoughtfully arranged things in a way that combines texture here of burnished metal, the texture of this powder horn that's shiny but just a little bit matte. We have glasses with liquid in them. Another one here. We have this very brilliant lobster. And we have a cloth here just rumpled on the table, but perhaps it's a tapestry of some type or a carpet. All of this texture as well as this pattern and coloring. This is a problem the artist has set for himself to create a scene here that he can work with as long as he wants to because there's no person waiting here and, and posing. The idea was that the combination of colors and shapes might be very interesting and also difficult for the artist to capture a problem to demonstrate how they might paint this. Now we have Vermeer that took still life to the next stage. It's actually a still life that involves a person. It's not a portrait. It's not one of those scenes of family life. It's a very simple act, this woman pouring milk out of a pitcher. But the way that she's framed by these ordinary household items, and the way that the artist has captured this flowing liquid out of a jug, in combination with the brilliant yellow and blue, it's a very visually interesting painting. And the subject matter is very commonplace. It's a still life, but it includes a real-life person standing very still. I've included this painting only for the purpose of showing you something that's happened with colors over the years. It's not in your book, but the reason I'm including it is when this was painted, all of these leaves were actually painted in green. These leaves, these leaves, and these leaves here too. But notice what's happened to the pigment. It's changed color over the years. Forms even a more interesting painting, I suppose, but it's not particularly what the artist had in mind. We're going to take a look in the next unit at the development of synthetic pigments that help to overcome this variability and this lack of permanence in some of the naturally occurring pigments that artists had used up until the time that synthetic pigments were developed in the 1800s. This is just a reminder of what it took for an artist to paint before the era of synthetic pigments. Here we have an assistant slaving away, grinding up pigments. The artist is painting, and as the artist needs a color, he might call out to his assistant that he needs something of this or that. Assistant then grinds like crazy and mixes oil in the proper proportion and prepares the paint. I've just included this to show you a page from a different book and a lump of pigment that was formed in a very funny way. This particular pigment was developed by feeding cows a very strange diet and then taking their urine and drying it and processing it. So before the development of synthetic pigments in the 1800s, which depended to a large degree on the development of organic chemistry, 
very strange things were still being done.